to mention some community and release management stuff uh, in the beginning and then talk a bit about various features. Uh, and uh, I try to build some, some, some coherent story to, the, to, the, to the, this middle part, but actually it's like a, you know, a, a fully connected graph that everything matters for something else. Um, so, uh, we keep uh, producing releases. Um, uh, this, it's not a steady pace. We, we, we try to make releases every two or three months and we fail at this every once in a while. Uh, when I was preparing those slides, the, mm, we, we were still planning to make a release in uh, June, July, but we still haven't produced RC1 for version 254. And we are already at uh, 2,500 uh, patches, and uh, usually we merge another 1,000 to 2,000 before, uh, between the time when we try uh, preparing for RC1 and the final release, so it will be a huge release. And I don't know. I ho still hope for an RC1 in early July. Um, the number of contributors varies, but it's, that it's not going down visibly. Um, an interesting development is that we have uh, more and more stable releases. So we release, for example, 253, and then backport some patches to 253. Uh, 3.1.2, we are currently at 253.5, uh, and we are currently at, I think, 251.16 or something like that. So, uh, the, I mean, it, it, it's usually hundreds of patches backported to those stable releases, and more and more distros are using those point releases to build their packages, and there's quite a bit of demand for them. Uh, if we keep up current pace for this year, we'll have 44 point releases. Um, between various branches. And uh, if you have some patch that you think should, be, should land in a stable release, you can uh, either uh, mark it as needs stable backport in the upstream uh, GitHub repository, or you can uh, file a pull request uh, against the stable, uh, systemd stable, repo with, with a backport, just do uh, make sure to use git commit minus x to get the hash of the original patch. Uh, uh, or sometimes it's enough to make a comment if you, if you cannot do the other things uh, in, in a pull request. Um, and we have, uh, well, about 2,000 open issues. And the, uh, it is growing, but in a manageable way. Uh, we actually have, I mean, I think we close about 80% of issues that are opened. Uh, so this, this is just the, the diff. Uh, and there's a split half and half between bugs and RFEs. Um, we would like to m make this number go down, but it's, it's proving tough. Uh, but it's, at least it's not bad news. Uh, in Fedora, uh, we uh, made a, 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 an effort over the last year so th those numbers are for, I mean, the, the growth numbers are for a period of approximately the last year. In Fedora, we made an effort to reduce the number of open bugs. Um, and in particular, uh, David Tardon and I have been working on going through the bugs and, and closing some stuff. And I think like this, this reduction of 50%, it's pretty nice. We, we, we don't see that often. Um, so, uh, and now let me talk about uh, well, features and uh, be, being removed first and added later. So uh, I, this has been going on for the last uh, 10 years approximately. Uh, but there are those two related uh, ideas that you have a, a, a something called unmerged user. I mean, the naming is terrible, right? That you have separate hierarchies of bin and, uh, and user bin, uh, and lib and user lib, and, 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 and so on for every other possible directory. And you look in both places. And if you have that, you have the other thing called split user, where you delay the mounting of the second half until late in boot. And most distributions have stopped doing that. Uh, well, so Fedora did that uh, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, other distributions maybe a bit later. but. Um, the point is that we have been maintaining uh, this uh, split, uh, the unmerged user thing, 
in systemd code uh, um, all the time. Uh, and it's, uh, well, it's, if you don't have this, then this doesn't make any sense because you have parallel directories, but you always use both. So this and, I mean, both things are going away. Uh, we, a patch is ready uh, in system that just removes all this code. We will probably measure it a bit later after 254 has been released just to make the release of 254 faster. Uh, another thing that is going away is uh, support for C groups V1. Uh, this, this is a more complex problem, but uh, the way that systemd works is that you have, you, you specify settings in the language of uh, C group V2. Uh, and systemd will translate the settings to the, as much as possible for v1 if you're using v1. But this translation is uh, not always possible in any meaningful way. Uh, and v1 uh, is not hierarchical, so you cannot do unprivileged delegation because the, if you delegate stuff on v1, the delegatee can take more than the parent has, so uh, it's not very useful. Uh, and uh, some features are missing on V1. So we, we want to get rid of this and simplify our code base quite a bit, so sometimes, sometime next year. Um, and uh, this is a bit, uh, so I if you are using Fedora, like um, there was a time where this warning popped up in various places, so uh, systemd tools are being unhappy when they are called in a system without slash proc mounted. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I mean, it the code continues, but it's, uh, it doesn't like the situation. And uh, why, uh, why are we making this warning? So we need access to proc uh, self FD symlinks to, ma to work with file system descriptors. And uh, without slash proc, we don't have this, this kernel API and we cannot do various things with file descriptors that we would like, would like to do. Um, so, okay, and now about some positive stuff. So, uh, uh, the, mm, we had this issue that uh, users were reporting that when they use uh, user units, they specify some settings and those settings have no effect. Uh, and this is because systemd in general works this way that if you have settings for system units uh, and those settings cannot uh, be applied because the system is, doesn't have the right architecture or doesn't have, or was, something was compiled without the right capabilities, settings are ignored. So, I mean, you can, for example, specify both SLinux Linux and App Armor policy for a unit and the one that can be applied on a given system or maybe none of them would be applied, the other one would be just ignored. And this meant that um, you could specify some, some settings like, I don't know, protect home for, for a system unit and it would work. You would specify it for a user unit and it would be silently ignored because the user manager does not have enough privileges to, uh, to apply the setting. It could have the privileges if it used a user namespace for, um, uh, for, for, for the unit but this wasn't on, and you had to apply this uh, explicitly. So this is something of a compact break, but we are enabling it because there were many reports of people being um, uh, uh, su negatively surprised, and we'll just enable private users in many more cases now, so, so there will be more sandboxing for user units. Um, and in general, uh, the number of various sandboxing options is, is growing all the time. Uh, I mean, it will probably be a separate talk, to talk about them. There is a very nice tool called uh, Analyze Security. Uh, actually, there's two. There's Analyze Security that will give you hints about security settings, and there is Systemd Analyze Verify, which will check the unit file for correctness and give warnings if, if something is wrong. They are both useful for, for hints and for checking. Um, a small thing, but useful, is uh, open file setting. Uh, so quite often units would um, use a shell just to redirect some file descriptor to, to some file from some file. Uh, this can be done now mm, natively by the, by the manager. And the, the, of course the advantage is that things are simplified and also that uh, the unit can run with sometimes with less privileges because it can get access to a file uh, uh, as a, as a file descriptor and not be able to open the file otherwise. 
um, we have a new unit type. So um, type equals notify is an old thing. So it, it's a, um, when units are started, uh, the unit uh, systemd likes to make this operation synchronous. So it wants to know when the unit is actually ready. Uh, and uh, in type equals notify, the unit runs and sends a notification message using the SD notify protocol when it's ready. And for reloads, uh, we usually use, um, I mean, the, the most, uh, the easiest option for, for reload is just to let systemd send a CCAP signal to the unit. Um, but uh, this is asynchronous. The, 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 the signal, by definition, is uh, I mean, without any communication in the other way. So with type equals notify reload, uh, the unit is supposed to send a SD notify notification after a reload has been finished. So we get a, a convenient uh, implementation of reloads with synchronicity. So readiness notification. Uh, another feature, it gets a separate slide because it's, I think it's pretty nice, uh, is soft reboot. So it's a, uh, you say, uh, it's a new way to, to restart the machine that brings down all the user space, unmounts things, and instead of actually rebooting, restarts uh, re-execs systemd and brings up the user space again. So, um, so we have like a normal reboot which goes through the bootloader and a new kernel. We have k-exec which just skips the bootloader and goes directly to a new kernel. And we have now we have soft reboot which skips both of those steps and goes directly to a new systemd. Uh, another feature, this one even gets an icon, is uh, the IO cost controller. So actually this is a, a kernel feature. Um, mostly, and this, this is uh, I mean, quite common in systemd stuff that we are just providing a thin layer around the kernel. Uh, so uh, when you have a block device, uh, you, you get some number that it, it has some bandwidth, uh, I don't know, 500 megabytes per second read speed or write speed. And we know this is not true in general because the, the, the actual bandwidth depends on uh, what the device is doing and how much writing you are doing at the same time, so I know initially you, you, you specify some 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 some, some uh, blocks to write, and it is very quick because it actually goes to some internal uh, buffer, and then things slow down quite a bit. And depending whether you on whether you are reading at the same time, the write speed will uh, vary and so on. So the idea is to do fairly extensive benchmarking of a specific model of a drive, uh, come up with a a simplified model that describes how the drive behaves under various conditions. Uh, and then you can set a meaningful policy uh, to, to divide the bandwidth between uh, services and, and groups and so on. And uh, where system D comes in is that uh, this is implemented in the kernel, but we need to provide the policy. And, and system D now has a, a UDEF, um, UDEF rules to figure out uh, what Set, what, what policy to set for a, for a drive based on the model, uh, firmware revision, and so on. And uh, in the hardware database, we, have, we are starting to uh, grow a set of rules for different drive models. So uh, if you have a, a drive model that is missing, you can do the benchmarking and submit a pull request, and then it will be applied to all the drives in, well, wherever people are using this. Uh, so this was actually contributed by Facebook folks. Um, so, and now some sub features, and here sub stands for subterranean, I and mean, those are large features, they're just not very visible. Uh, and so this is another kernel thing. The, uh, when we use process numbers, PEDS, to refer to uh, mm, processes, it is well known that uh, the, a process can die, we wait a bit and another process gets born and it gets the same number. So, so PEDs are not a reliable way to refer to processes. And the kernel has gained uh, APIs to refer to processing using file descriptors, PDFDs. Uh, so you, we, this, the, this ambiguity goes away. And uh, various systemd tools have been converted to, uh, to use PDFDs internally. Uh, and also stuff like libsystemd and the dbus APIs are getting uh, extended with a second set of calls that allow PDFDs to be used in instead of PIDs. 
So this is quite a bit of work, but it's generally not visible if it, if it works. Um, and kind of in a similar vein, uh, internally we are converting uh, m a lot of our code to use file descriptors to refer to inodes instead of the path name. Um, the most obvious uh, thing is that this allows, uh, well, removes the, the possibility of a time of check, time of use race between, uh, I don't know, checking the file and, and executing the file. Uh, but also it makes it easier to write code which um, operates on subtrees of the file system hierarchy, so change routes, and also uh, disk images that you mount temporarily somewhere and then you do an operation on the um, uh, on this image. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to mention kernel install, it was rewritten in C, it used to be a bash script, and this meant that, um, well, first of all, all logic had to be implemented, like for example, to, fi to find where the ESP is, which is actually a very complex uh, game of guessing, uh, um, had to be duplicated, into, and this was very annoying, so in the end, um, Iwatanabe rewrote it, in, uh, and it also means that we can use FDs in kernel install, and uh, kernel install will now operate fairly nicely on, uh, you can say, say, kernel install dash dash image equals image name, and then do an installation on the inside of a uh, uh, disk image. Uh, I mean, I think not yet, but soon. Uh, and so th this brings me to, uh, um, disk images. So uh, the, the, the idea has been in around for a while, but the name is new. So discoverable disk image is an uh, image, uh, or, or um, yeah, a disk image that, or an actual disk that uh, follows the discoverable partition specification. So it has a GPT table, and in the GPT table, the role that the different partitions should be used for is specified by their uh, partition type identifier, uh, and there's, you don't need other configuration. Um, and uh, uh, system dissect has been around for a while, but it, it has grown new uh, capabilities. Uh, so for example, it can uh, you, you give an image and it can recursively mount the image on, the, on some mount point. Uh, so, and the, the mounting is done in the same way that if you booted the image and you would auto discover that, I don't know, like slash var, uh, a, a specific partition is slash var and another partition is slash home based on the, uh, on the DPS. Uh, people talk about uh, mm, uh, supply chain issues, so, so a bit in this uh, topic, the M3 uh, um, command give, makes like a recursive report uh, of the contents of an image. Um, and this is a system dissect uh, <coughs> example. I try to make, make it fix, fit on a slide, so this is like, you know, after surgery. Uh, so it opens the, the image uh, and extracts the OS3 file so it knows what is, I mean, what, what the image thinks about itself. Uh, and prints some metadata and partition uh, list. But it also has this, this idea of using the same uh, image for different things. So this is where the DDI power is. So this particular image is, can be booted uh, in UFI, so as a real system or in QEMU. Uh, it can be used as a container, uh, but it's not suitable for the other things. And so, so we have portable services, so a service that is like a normal system service but comes with its own file system. Um, an initRD, and a DDI can also be an extension for each of those things uh, above. So uh, we have the same format, uh, but depending on what partitions are inside and, and some metadata is used in different ways. And uh, this, this area in general has been, th there have been a lot of development in, uh, in systemd f with capabilities for this. Uh, in particular, how to apply the extensions in various places and how to check that the extensions are signed properly. Um, I have a second talk in the afternoon where I talk more about this because it's just not, not enough time here. Uh, 
but briefly. So uh, we, we have extensions that allow us to uh, add stuff to an Im image. For example, we have an immutable image that is signed. We boot it, and we want to extend it. And, and we have those extensions that it can, can also be immutable and signed. But there are also other mechanisms. So uh, uh, mm, a lot of work has been uh, going into credentials. So uh, credentials are this system, the idea that you have a blob of data. Uh, for example, it could be a, some <coughs> configuration snippet or a certificate file. And uh, the manager will take this, th this blob. Uh, and when it is starting, uh, it's it stored somewhere. And when it is uh, starting a service, the service specified that it wants a specific credential. The manager finds this credential and creates a, a file uh, before the service is started, and then the service can load the file. So this is, doesn't sound useful. Uh, but uh, the thing is that this, this storage uh, can vary a lot. So it can be a file on disk, um, and the credential can be also encrypted. And then systemd will decrypt the credential before passing it to the service. It can come from a pipe or a socket. So it, this means that credentials can be generated dynamically uh, when requested. And they can be stored in uh, QMOS and BIOS fields and some, some other similar stuff, which means that you can pass a credential to a virtual machine. Uh, they can be specified on the kernel command line. The bootloader will load them from, I mean, as the boot will load them from uh, slash ESP, uh, not slash, uh, from the ESP partition. And credentials are hierarchical in the sense that we can have a situation where we have a credential on disk. This is pass, passed to, to the uh, virtual machine manager, and then this passes it to the virtual machine, and the virtual machine passes it to, well, assistant in the virtual machine loads it and passes it to a service, and so on and so on, right? Uh, and an example of how this is, uh, how we make use of this is um, there's a specific credential called VMM notify socket. Uh, and uh, we put a VM, we pass the credential to the uh, to QEMU, uh, and inside of the email, or, or inside of the machine, um, system deboots and sees that there it has a credential. I mean, it looks for a credential by this name, and sends notification to this uh, um, uh, to this socket. So, for example, it, start, it sends ready equals one when it when it has finished booting. So this allows us to cross the uh, the, the boundary between the host and the, mm, uh, the machine. And this is done in a fairly nice way. There is no network involved. It's a, um, a fairly generic mechanism. Uh, and uh, um, so also, it can send an exit status notification. So basically, you can have the situation where you uh, make the virtual machine and the container behave in the same way, and you can specify an exit status and have the machine fail. For example, very nice for unit tests, where you do some tests in a virtual machine or in a container or both, and you want to have this uniform. Um, another tool that has, been, uh, has seen, seen significant work is systemd measure. So uh, the idea is that you build a new kernel, and before you boot the kernel, um, yeah, well, you, you build a kernel and an ID and figure out some command line options and, and stuff like that. And with all that, before you boot it, you calculate what PCR values will be, uh, what the PCR values will be uh, after you have booted this, uh, mm, this combination of things. And uh, this means that you can, uh, well, you, you can predict those numbers and it means that you can sign policies for them. So this is all geared towards pre-calculating PCR values and signing policies and encrypting uh, secrets um, in a way that they're bound to certificates, not specific PCR values. Uh, and a related topic is that we have a new idea of boot phase paths. So systemd will write those strings uh, at various points during uh, the boot sequence which means that the PCR values change at, de at defined points during the boot time. Uh, and 
this means that, for example, you can have a key for the root volume, the looks for the root looks lux volume, uh, that can be bound to the to the TPM and can only be decrypted in the interd because after you have exited from the interd, the PCR is changed and you cannot access the, the same secret anymore. Uh, and so, so on. At, um, and there's also a number of uh, stuff that is services that write information about the machine into various PCRs so that they can build more useful policies. So, for example, like uh, the machine ID and the, the information about disks that are mounted in various places. Um, and again, this is about building PCR policies that actually are useful. Uh, and um, something that I have been working on is a, a helper to create unified kernel images. So this is like uh, UKIFI uses system D measure. Uh, so you, you, have a, you have a kernel and an interd and, and some command line settings, and now you call system D measure to figure out what PCR values will be. You, you build a uh, PCR policy, all of this, you sign it, you put it also into the um, unified kernel image, possibly multiple of those policies, and then you sign the, this, this whole combined thing for secure boot with yet another key. So it's quite a bit of messiness, and Yukify makes this easier. It has been uh, rewritten to, uh, now it does, I mean, system D measure doesn't require root privileges because it doesn't access the TPM anymore. And so Yukify uh, also doesn't require root privileges, which is just nicer and faster. Um, and uh, another tool that has seen a lot of work is systemd repart. Uh, so it is, uh, you have a, you specify a set of partitions that you expect to see on the machine, and when the repart is executed, it will uh, match those definitions to the partitions that are on disk, and create any that are, any that are missing, and maybe, for example, grow the ones that are too small, and so on. Uh, and if everything matches, then it's just an idempotent operation. Uh, and uh, so uh, repart is nice because it works atomically. So it, it first opens a device uh, without having a partition in the partition table, goes to a specific offset, writes the contents, uh, and after this has been done, uh, syncs the disk, and then creates a partition entry at the beginning of the disk. So the, the partition appears with contents, I mean with a file system and files in the file system if you, if you, if you specify so. Already uh, at, uh, at, at once. And um, we used to do it in this way that we would um, use a loopback device to, to mount the, uh, a temporary partition somewhere. But now the code has been reworked to uh, use file system tools to write the file system contents, including files directly at a specific offset. And this, is, this doesn't require root privileges, so you can build file uh, system images inside of a container and then also as an unprivileged user. Uh, and it's also faster. Uh, it's nice. Uh, and uh, there has been also quite a bit of work on the system D boot bootloader and the system D stub. Uh, so system D boot is the, the bootloader for, for UFI, and system D stub is the thing that is prepended to the, to the kernel to crea create a unified kernel image. And uh, we used to have a dependency on GNU UFI. It was quite a lot of code, and it was uh, annoying to have this. Uh, we, we wrote a bunch of stuff to, to get rid of the dependency, so uh, they are now smaller, and, and, and we also like our code better. Uh, you can use SD boot to, for direct kernel boots under QEMU. So you, you, you call QEMU dash dash kernel uh, SD boot, and, you, and then SD boot works as a, as a kernel and, and will actually load another kernel from inside of the image. Uh, uh, um, this has been for a while, around for a while, but it's kind of, kind of becoming more interesting with the uh, whole work on unified kernel images that uh, SD boot will do enrollment of secure boot keys uh, if um, uh, if the, um, the machine is booted in setup mode. 
Uh, and I also wanted to mention that uh, there's some improvements to pass the, uh, the random seed to the kernel. Uh, so the kernel gets started, already has uh, the random, random pool populated, so we don't need to delay waiting for, for randomness. This used to be a, a problem, a, a source of delays in the past. Uh, and uh, Anaconda, the, the installer used for Fedora and Rail uh, systems, is getting support for systemd boot. So th this pull request has been merged. I, it's not complete yet, but um, hopefully we will be able to install systems using SD boot fairly soon. Uh, and uh, I wanted to mention that we don't bite, and uh, it, you know, like there's, there are issues and stuff to work on, and uh, we merge pull requests uh, quite often. And I, I will be happy to see m uh, more contributors. And uh, yeah, so four minutes for questions. Uh, sorry, I I didn't catch this. Uh, so the question was whether soft reboot will work with OS3 systems. I don't think there, there's any reason why not. Um, I mean, what it does, it, it, after it has brought the user space down, it calls the equivalent of uh, like a switch root operation, and you specify a new systemd binary and potentially some options. So we, we can figure out a way to boot OS3, the same one or a different one. Yes, the same kernel, yes. And actually, processes can survive. The, the, I mean, you can mark processes not to be killed, so it's not a complete replacement. 